Thank you. Everything was correct except the last part. That was fake news. <laughs> So thanks so much. It's a pleasure to uh, be back again. Um, so I'm going to talk about charisma and uh, some of the collective um, research that I've been doing over the last 20 or so years uh, on the topic. Um, charisma was a word that was sullied probably quite badly by um, some of the despots um, in the, um, who uh, you know, marked history. Um, I'm talking in particular about Hitler and some others. And, you know, over time, we, the, the word wasn't used much. Um, the word for leader in German is still not used, uh, given uh, how Hitler um, um, uh, uh, used it um, to refer to him. Um, but as uh, we go with time, we see that it's uh, um, much more accepted. And, uh, you know, here's some uh, collage of uh, different snippets uh, referring to charisma, charismatic leadership. Um, in some uh, big uh, media outlets. So what is charisma? Um, can we measure it? Can we develop it? Does it matter for organizational performance? These are questions I'm going to try and answer um, today, and uh, I'll do that by starting off in a very indirect way, uh, something that may seem very surprising to you. Here's the correlation. On the uh, x-axis, it's deep charisma, an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm using neural networks, which we trained to identify um, charismatic themes in speeches. So on the x-axis, we have ratings of a computer. And on the y-axis, we have human ratings. And these are correlations that are, are out of sample. That is, we train deep charisma on 96 TED Talks. We refined it on 96 more TED Talks and then tested it out of sample in 48 other talks. In other words, that for the last test, um, we, we ex ante um, uh, asked Deep Charisma to give us a score, um, and then we correlated that with three humans, and we find a correlation of 0.92. That's, that's very strong. <laughs> that's it's as strong as uh, very highly trained humans are uh, correlating with each other. Just to give you an idea, we have Rater 1, Rater 2, Rater 3. Uh, rate a mean, um, DC, deep charisma, looking at all the tactics simultaneously, or the mean of them. And you can see how the raiders correlate with each other. These are expert raiders that we've trained several months to identify these, these charismatic tactics independently. Um, and you see on the blue, um, these are what you would refer to as the item rest correlations of deep charisma with the three humans. Um, and when you look at the three humans by themselves, their item rest correlations are about as good slightly better than deep charisma, but nonetheless, you know, very, very strong, 0 0.92 versus 0 0.93, 94, and 88. So how do we get to this point? Um, let me give you some more um, evidence of how this matters. Um, we, although we train deep charisma on TED Talks, which is something very modern, tech-oriented, etc., we went um, to, uh, um, to speeches of U.S. presidents going back to 1916 and their challenges. Um, and, you know, although the context is completely different, we get a, an out-of-sample correlation of about 0.59 with the uh, Deep Charisma program calibrated on TED Talks in rating charisma of U.S. presidents and challenges, which is in a completely different context. Now, we're going to update, and every day we are feeding more speeches um, to this program, so, um, you know, how do we get to the point where we can mathematically identify these principles and, and, and do such a great job? In the future, um, hopefully you'll be, able to, you'll be able to go to a website, um, upload a speech, and we'll be able to um, split out to you um, how charismatic it is. And this, you know, at the, at the click of a finger. Uh, you know, for me to do this with humans, I have to train them first, um, and then it takes a long time to do. They get tired, they, get, they make mistakes, they get bored. Uh, you know, this program will always be sitting there and, and we'll be able to give um, scores for researchers who are interested in, in doing this research. Perhaps one day we might use it for leadership development, and perhaps one day we might even use it to help people to write speeches. Um, at this time, I don't know if you're aware, but um, deep neural networks can even um, um, compose music, uh, can even paint art, uh, and, and can even fool humans into thinking that humans did this. So this is quite amazing stuff. Um, here's an interesting uh, uh, finding from um, pitching contests. Uh, so as Ian said, I'm very interested in facial appearance, and you'll see why this 
um, also causes huge problems in understanding whether charisma matters for anything. Um, so we studied pitches. These are about one and a half minute pitches. And these are people um, who are pitching to venture capitalists who have oodles of money and they want to invest it in some good idea. You would hope that they care more about the idea and not what the person looks like. But lo and behold, um, here's the x-axis. We took photographs of the people pitching and then we ran a, a thing in our lab and we, we asked our students to rate them on attractiveness. Um, and we just used that score to predict the probability that the person would get to the next round of the pitching contest, independent of what they said. And this relationship is, is very strong. So the mean attractiveness rating was about 352. Going from minus one standard deviation of attractiveness to plus one increases the likelihood by about 128% that the person pitching would get to the next round of the pitching contest. That's quite sad. But here's the good news. The number of charismatic tactics that they used in the pitch mattered greatly too. So irrespective of how people looked, um, objectively speaking, if they signaled charisma using certain tactics that I'm going to identify to you in a few minutes, that also increased the, the likelihood, one going from one standard deviation below and one above the mean, increased the likelihood by an equal amount, in fact, slightly stronger uh, than that of facial performance. So how did we get to this point? First thing is we dumped the traditional ways charisma has been evaluated. That is perceptual measures using questionnaires. They don't help very much and you'll see why in a few minutes. And this is 99% of the studies done up to this point uh, use such measures. Second thing is um, we went back and, uh, to the drawing board and, and rethought how we should define charisma because the definition of charisma will necessarily drive how we operationalize it and how we measure it. Second, uh, third thing we did is, um, as Kurt Lewin said, the best way to understand something is to try to change it. Um, so a lot of experimental work to see how um, people would react to the same person um, exhibiting um, charisma or not, but transmitting the same information content and holding constant everything else like facial appearance and other things that may matter. Um, we tested these things also in field experiments, in real situations where we've hired real workers um, to see whether it actually makes a difference to the economic performance of firms. Um, in this case, temporary firms that we set up specifically to test a hypothesis about the um, impact of charisma. And uh, lately, as you've seen, we've been using also archival measures, measures that we hope have not been tainted by attitudinal biases, perceptual biases and other things. Um, so the first thing I mentioned is that we threw out endogenous measures of charisma. But what I mean endogenous is that they depend on something. So when you ask somebody, like in the MLQ, this person paints an inspiring vision of the future, um, it's highly problematic that that rating um, can be used as an exogenous variable. It hasn't been manipulated. You're measuring it endogenously. So it's an outcome of some process. Why does the person see a particular individual as being inspiring? And many things can fit, feed into that rating. Okay, so remember why in psychology we manipulate something is to make sure it's exogenous, and in this way we balance um, in 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 the conditions wherein we we um, randomize subjects, we balance any threats to validity in an equal way, so we know what the causal effect is if you're placed in one group versus another. Now, if you are measuring the perceptions of somebody, those perceptions have not been randomized. They depend on a process. And if this process also drives the dependent variable, you have what's called the endogeneity problem, which is confounding in, in a massive way. And any regression coefficients, structural equation models, ANOVA models that you run are going to give you possibly completely wrong um, coefficients. So perceptual ratings are biased by omitted variables, which correlate which may correlate with the outcomes too. One I just showed you, facial appearance. So if someone has, um, is more symmetrical, is more beautiful, they're going to be necessarily related higher on many things that stereotypically go with that initial classification, in including whether the person will have any impact on any outcome measures. Personality matters. Intelligence matters. The person's gender matters. Um, company resources provided to them matter. Selection process matters. So there are so many variables at various levels of analysis which may necessarily affect how the leader um, is perceived or how the leader may act. I may act in a more inspiring way with Ian because Ian is smarter. And I may act with a less inspiring, uh, in a less inspiring way with somebody else because they are less smart. So actually, the performance of the person I'm trying to influence may actually drive the leadership style that I choose. So we have huge, huge problem. This is called the reverse causality problem. 
Uh, another way you, this reserve, reverse causality problem can manifest itself is from performance cue effects. If the person rating the leader knows that the leader has been successful in doing something, they will rate them higher on any positively valenced measure. So this stuff we've known for 30, 40 years ago, but everyone ignores this completely because it's an inconvenient truth. Um, I mean, the work that, that, that Rush, Thomas and Law did, th this is hardly cited. I mean, it's cited, okay, it's got 100, 200 citations, but completely ignored by most leadership scholars because it's a very inconvenient truth. Um, ratings are not behavioral, but evaluative judgments. They are semantic, some total evaluations of what the person thinks, and these things depend on many omitted causes which affect the evaluation. And those same omitted causes may be driving the dependent variable that you're observing. So what correlation people see between charisma and why is not caused because charisma causes why, but because both are caused by an omitted variable. So this is highly problematic. And then definitions are tautological, which start off, you know, charismatic leaders are inspiring. I mean, no kidding, Sherlock. Uh, the explanandum re-describes the explanands, um, and, 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 and that then guarantees we're going to find um, significant results, especially when we, when we make statements like, you know, transformational leaders are very effective. So therefore, if something's effective, it must be because a transformational leader caused it. So this makes our theories uh, not refutable, not testable, uh, tautologies, and it's very, very hard to advance science in this way. As you can imagine, I'm very skeptical of any meta-analysis now that has been fed by any of these studies that have been relied on endogenous measures of charisma. I'm guilty myself. My first big paper and my most cited paper is actually on studying the MLQ. So I've recently turned my own fire against my own work, um, just like in the medical sciences we should do or in the physical sciences we should do. As we learn more, we should um, uh, disown work that is not correct, even if it's our own work. So um, we've redefined in a paper written in the annual reviews of in... Um, Aeropub Annual Reviews of Organizations, Psychology and Organizational Behavior, um, that charisma is value-based, symbolic and emotion-laden leader signaling. So we use the term signaling to make some parallels to economic models of signaling or evolutionary mo models of signaling. So signaling is used to reduce information asymmetries between the person signaling and the person observing the, uh, the, uh, the entity that's signaling. For example, a springbok. Um, when lions are prowling around and looking to see where they're going to get the next bite to eat, springboks start jumping around. Um, why do they do that? Um, what information are they conveying to the lion? How can their jumping around improve the fitness of the springboks collectively and also the fitness of the lion? By jumping higher, it tells the lion, hey, don't come after me. <laughs> Go after the other one that's not jumping so high because I'm not going to be an easy meal. Don't waste your energy on me. Okay? So it's a costly signal. To jump higher, you need to be fitter and stronger and younger. So this signal is not available to springboks who aren't able to do this. Okay? So in this way, the fitness of the springbok is, in, is, uh, is helped by signaling transparently, honestly, and credibly, but it also helps the fitness of the lion. Same thing with charisma. It's more easily accessible to people who have high ability, and it comes at a cost. It's a costly signal. It's not easy to reproduce. Let me, sh let me tell you why. Um, Aristotle in the Poetics, and this has actually inspired much of my work, and in the Rhetoric, which is an excellent, excellent um, uh, treatise on, 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 on charisma, only smart individuals can deliver creative rhetoric. For um, Aristotle said the, the mark of true genius is the ability to master metaphor. We do know now empirically um, that, cre that generating creative metaphor, which is essential for symbolic communication, uh, depends in part on, on uh, fluid intelligence. Um, secondly, by signaling your values, so remember we said it's emotion-laden, symbolic, and value-based leader signaling. By signaling your values, you attract people who may be um, uh, agreeing with your values, but you are going to repel people who may not like your values. So just similar to the springbok, you will help those who like you, and, and, and uh, the ones who don't like you will also receive information that's valuable to them. Um, so this comes at a cost because you can't just say anything and not pay a cost for uh, having said that. And the third thing is, uh, once you signal your values and what should be done, you lock yourself in. If you give a tangible vision, a symbolic vision that people can see, touch and smell, that has some moral overtones, if you don't deliver the goods, you're going to pay a cost for that. So this kind of binds you in. So, you know, objectively, someone could be signaling charisma, 
but the charismatic effect will not occur, particularly if values are not shared. So, although Obama is objectively very charismatic to half of Americans who are more right-wing, um, um, he wouldn't seem that way at all. They, 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 they might seem as a clown. Um, so, this theory is not guaranteed to produce effectiveness outcomes or good results. It depends very much on the context, it depends very much on what's been signaling, and it depends very much on who the audience is. Okay, so it's not a catch-all construct like many positively or negatively valenced leadership theories like ethical leadership, authentic leadership, transformational leadership, or on the other side, destructive leadership or um, um, abusive supervision or what have you. Those constructs, the way that they are defined, the way that they are measured, are always going to be guaranteed to give you positive and negative uh, results, um, and, and that's all driven by omitted variables. So this makes our theory testable, vulnerable, and refutable. So the three components of charisma that, that matter um, are firstly framing. So framing is about how the leader directs attention and triggers a vision and, and, um, and focuses on particular issues uh, that are dear to, 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 the, to the leader and, and, for, for, and hopefully will resonate with the followers. Secondly, the substance is important. What values are you defending? What's the raison d'etre? Why are we doing this? What is the strategic goal? So that's what I call the substance. And the third thing is the delivery. Now it turns out that framing and substance are much more important than delivery. So they more to do you know, with the substance here and this is more the shadow. So I'm not saying that delivery doesn't matter. Of course, voice um, and body language and all that do play a strong role, but that not, doesn't necessarily define um, charisma. It does signal emotion, um, and that's necessary, but really what he said is much more important than the delivery modus, although all three are important. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So this is a, a video with um, Barack Obama in the acceptance speech of the Democratic convention in 2012. Um, I'm showing this because we also uh, have a study where we use the charisma to predict, um, the charisma difference between the Republic and the Democrat to predict who will win the US election. So why don't we play the little snippet, please, in the VLC play. Now, our friends down in Tampa at the Republican convention were more than happy to talk about everything they think is wrong with America. But they didn't have much to say about how they'd make it right. They want your vote, but they don't want you to know their plan. And that's because all they had to offer is the same prescriptions they've had for the last 30 years. Have a surplus? Try a tax cut. Deficit too high? Try another. <laughs> Feel a cold coming on? Take two tax cuts, roll back some regulations, and call us in the morning. Don't you miss the guy? <laughs> I saw a little uh, remnants of that in the audience. Um, so, you know, this, this speech is using some very specific techniques that we've identified in um, some work that we published first in 2011 in the Academy of Management, Learning and Education. I'll just show you the speech. Firstly, it's, um, it's got three lists of three, so that's a magic number, list of three. I'll tell you why in a few minutes. He starts off with an anecdote, which is useful for triggering a vision, and the anecdote can be very short. You know, if, as Mandela once said in Paulsmore Prison um, um, in Robben Island, once he invokes that meaning, you know exactly what he did in Paulsmore Prison or in Robben Island. We all know what happens at the Republican convention, which they had last week in Tampa. This is now going back to 2012, that the Republicans always talk about cutting tax. If the economy is doing well, we should cut taxes. If it's doing badly, well, we should cut taxes. So he's playing on this in a humorous way. You know, how can the doctor the party now prescribe the same medicine when the patient has one disease or the absence of the disease. Um, next thing is there's a contrast which contrasts his position from what he, uh, his opponents wish to do. He has another contrast. He has a metaphor that's very powerful for triggering a vision. Then he asks a rhetorical question, a rhetorical question, a rhetorical question, and gives answer, answer, and answer with metaphor. And I put humor in parentheses because that's also useful for uh, triggering charismatic um, inferences, but can be very dangerous as well because it cuts both ways. So what are these things in specifically? So firstly, in framing, 
what we've discovered is that to see, touch, and smell the vision, you must use metaphor stories. That helps to make a parallel, makes people easy to remember what you're talking about, and it's easy to understand. So contrast is like the famous Kennedy. Um, contrast is not what your party can do for you, but what you can do for your party. We're not here to talk about academic mumbo jumbo. We're here to talk about the practical realities of charisma. So it's splitting your position from a position that you're going to shoot down. Does charisma matter? Can we learn it? What is its economic impact? So by asking rhetorical questions, you focus the audience on certain themes that are obvious or you, which you will answer later on. And then lists and repetitions help to make things more evident and obvious. Lists of three in general sound nice, give an impression of completeness and are easy to remember. Um, the substance, as I mentioned earlier, has to do with what values you are defending. Why is it important? Why should we do it? What's the raison d'etre? Um, can you emulate and put into words what people are thinking, people are feeling, and people want to say, their hopes, their fears, and their expectations? That helps to close the psychological gap between the speaker and the collective. And then it's also identifying goals and the confidence that the goals are achievable, linked back again to the uh, values. And the third thing that we looked at um, is, is uh, delivery, voice, facial expressions, and body language. Being unconventional also signals, you know, one is creative, humor as well, humor can signal creative intelligence, but again, these things are pretty dangerous, so I, I don't recommend they're used all the time, they need to be used in homeopathic um, doses. So what we've done is we can measure these things um, in archival data, and they're not tainted by all these problems that I showed you before. They directly depend, we believe, on the leader's preferences and, and other things. And depending on how we specify our econometric or psychometric model, um, we can take out possibly omitted causes that we haven't measured. I'll show you this when I um, uh, show you the data from a study that we've done in Twitter. So let me show you how this may matter and its economic utility. So I'm going to quickly run through the first field experiment. Um, I presented it in great detail at the European Association of Work and Organizational Psychology. So if anyone was in the audience, you probably remember this, but I'm going to go through this a bit quickly. So um, the basis for which we um, used to manipulate charisma was some uh, groundbreaking studies that were done initially by Towler, uh, pardon me, by uh, Howell and Frost, so Jane Howell uh, she did her dissertation on, on this. Um, then Towler and Frieser uh, published a couple of papers in, in uh, personnel psychology on showing how uh, we can manipulate these elements of charisma. And basically what I did is, is uh, I, I extended what they um, initially did and, and put a theory framework behind it. So we know that it can be trained. We know that it impacts perceptions of prototypicality. So the more a person signals charisma, the more prototypical they'll be seen of an effective leader, the more they will be liked, the more effect they will have for the leader. Um, we know that it does impact outcomes compared to other treatments, but a lot of these studies that have been done previously were in lab settings that were very abstract, you know, and, and, and building hypothetical, um, um, doing hypothetical tasks, um, and not compared to strong um, incentive conditions, uh, which we know can also affect performance. Um, this is the study I mentioned published in the Academy of Management Journal, where we used charisma to predict who would win the US presidency. Um, this is a model wherein we mix macroeconomic um, uh, predictors with psych ecological predictors. So what we take into account is how well the economy is doing, who's been in, in the, the party in power for how long. So an incumbent usually has an advantage when they run again. If they've been squatting the White House for eight years, they have a huge disadvantage. Um, if they're an incumbent and the economy is doing well, they will usually be rewarded. If they're doing badly, they will be punished. So what this model does is it uses attributions based on performance and inferences based on charisma to predict who will win. It turns out that when the economic factors are kind of fuzzy in predicting who's going to win, that's when charisma kicks in. Who's going to make the better commander in chief? Who do I trust more? Who's more likable? Um, and, and if you're interested, we have a podcast on this and it's also in the... Um, Academy Management Journal paper. Um, it correlates with effectiveness outcomes, but again, this is uh, <laughs> very much driven by endogeneity-prone correlations uh, done the usual way with questionnaire measures that, that I simply do not trust. So we, we really need to go back to the, the drawing board as Van Knippenberg and, and uh, Sim Sitkin have, have noted on this. So at this point in time, we 
do not, I do not know of one study, and if anyone can give me one, I'll be happy to, to, um, to eat my hat, um, that shows that charisma matters causally for performance of followers, and I'm not talking about in abstract settings, but I'm talking in real world situations, and this compared to realistic alternative treatments and not unfair comparisons, where you train one group to do something and you don't train the other, so you have a demand effect in one treatment condition and no demand in another, um, and especially um, compared to economic incentives, which is something that very easily companies can use to motivate workers. Um, so bearing this in mind, we designed uh, a few studies to really test whether our exogenous manipulation of charisma would matter. Um, and, and in this case, we're not going to have unfair comparisons. We're going to have really strong comparisons and comparisons where we have equal demand effects and the leader is also communicating the same information content, but also we're going to use economic incentives to see if we can get workers to move. Um, so we did a field experiment where we randomized 106 workers to one of three training conditions. They had to do a job as male sorters. So we were paying these people for real. We went to ADECO and we hired these workers through the normal channels. We had to pay ADECO to do this. We had to pay for the rooms in which to train the workers. We had to pay the, the, the male materials. We, we had to pay for the transport and training. I had to pay for, we had to pay for the actor to deliver the speeches. So this, this experiment cost us a, a quite a bit of money. At the end of the day, we were raising money for Birmingham's uh, children charity. So this was done also for a good cause. All the mail, uh, uh, all the envelopes we sent out were, were, were were destined to potential uh, donors. So uh, we randomized the workers to one of three conditions. We have a fixed wage condition where we gave a standard speech. So they are paid a fixed wage irrespective of their performance um, and um, they get a standard motivation speech. In another condition, they get the same standard motivation speech, but if they pass a critical threshold, we're going to give them a bonus. This bonus is determined economically from a pilot study that we've done. We know an average worker can do about 200 units in the time specified. So we set the bonus, the maximum we could pay so that it wouldn't increase the average unit cost per envelope. So that's called a cost neutral bonus in economics. Um, and by doing that, um, if it's cost neutral, there's a paper written by Eddie Lazier in the American Economic Review who showed that you can increase performance by approximately 20%. And then the third condition is we give the fixed wage, whatever you do, we're going to pay you, but instead of giving the standard speech, we give a charismatic speech. And you'll see the standard speech is not too bad. So the workers came in this room, the actor walked in over here, did his pitch, disappeared, and um, before that, uh, we had the um, administrator showing how to do the job and all that. Actor comes in, gives the pitch, disappears. Then the workers take these two bags home. They weigh about, um, about, uh, about 10... Uh, about five kilos each, I think, so about 20 pounds, these two bags. We pre-tested what an average person could carry home in about half an hour commute. Uh, some of the letters had mistakes on them on purpose because we're giving economic incentives to people. So those, those ones who have an incentive to, to do anything, to stuff anything in there to get extra money, um, uh, you know, we want to control for this. So we're going to take um, a random sample of, of work from all the workers and, and make sure that they do the job correctly. We have a 24-point checklist, how they fold it, how they do it, how they put it in, do they use the rubber band correctly, blah, blah, blah. Um, they need to keep track of any mistakes. Um, so we do this on purpose again to slow them down and make sure they're doing everything correctly. They've got to put everything nicely in the envelope and put them in neat bunches and then bring in the box the next day and then we pay them regardless of what they do. And the ones who have economic incentives, we pay them a bonus. The speeches have the same demand effects. They say the same thing in the same order. However, the stylistic delivery is different. I'm going to show you an example of that um, in a minute. So the two speeches have the same number of words. Very similar content, but charisma speech has more of the things that I mentioned before. More metaphor. I'll just let you look at the, the list quickly. So metaphors, stories and anecdotes, contrasts, questions. So lists where they explain some of these things that they're going to do to help the children. Sentiments of the collective setting a high ambitious goal, but not communicating how many envelopes the people should do. So that, that would be a, a, a confound if we actually communicate in the charisma condition, I want you to do 300. And we'd, so we don't communicate specifically what they should do, but we communicate that they should work as hard as they can. Um, confidence in goals and some of the nonverbal techniques you will see um, uh, are used more in the charismatic speech. Importantly, we hold moral conviction constant across the two treatments because the task is moral. They're there to help little children in hospital. 
Okay, so um, see an example of the speech, um, and I think it should play if I click the button. Let's see. Yes. You will help children because the letters you have are written to convince a potential donor to help the charity. Each letter can potentially help a child have a nice Christmas. Let me tell you why. Many gravely sick children will spend Christmas in hospital. This is obviously not a nice state of affairs for the children and their families. Thus, the charity will help families who cannot afford to be near their children during the Christmas period. Just how are you going to do something special? Well, the letters you have are written to convince a potential donor to help the charity. In a way, the letter is a ticket for a child to attain Christmas. Let me tell you why. Many gravely sick children will spend Christmas in hospital. And what must that be like for the parent, the child, the family? The charity will help families who cannot afford to be near their children during the Christmas period. So, you might think, well, I will just do what I have to. My extra effort won't really help. Yes, your extra effort will help. Just think of how many of you are in this room and all the other people that we have hired to do this task as well. Every letter helps. The more letters you can do for us, the more letters we have to send out in our fundraising drive. This, of course, means that the more donors we can potentially reach and the more you can potentially help the charity. At the end of the day, we may be able to make a much bigger difference to these sick children, which is really what matters most of all. So, please do your best by doing your job as well as you can to the best of your ability. Doing so will really help make a difference to the children. Of course, this will help you to earn some extra money too, so we are all winning here. So. You might think, well, I'll just do what I have to. I mean, will my extra effort really help? Yes, it will. This reminds me of a story about an old man who, while walking along the seashore, noticed a girl picking up starfish and throwing them into the sea. The old man approached her saying, what are you doing? And she replied, well, I, I'm throwing starfish into the sea because the sun is coming up and the starfish will die. But, said the man, there are thousands of starfish. The, the sun is high and the, the tide is going out. How can you possibly make a difference? The girl bent down, picked up a starfish, threw it into the sea and said, well, I made a difference to that one. Remember, each letter is important. The more letters we send out, the better. So do work as hard as you can and do work as precisely as you can. That is all I have to say. Please do the best that you can, because in this way, we can all better help the charity. Thank you for listening to me. I'll let Giovanna conclude the briefing. Thank you. Remember, each letter is a ticket for a child to attend Christmas. The more tickets we issue, the better. So, work hard, work smart, and think of the kids. Every time you open an envelope, imagine that the flap is like a mouth that is whispering to you, work hard, work smart, think of the kids. Yes, you may think that I've gone do lally, but I know you can do it. So, what are we going to do? I'll let Giovanna conclude the briefing. Thank you. Stephanie, which I'm sure many of you know. He was the Prime Minister just before the World War. So, when we wrote the speech, you can imagine my economist colleagues were like, what the hell are you doing? Bus tickets and flying starfish and whispering envelopes? This is crazy. This is nuts. I, I managed to convince them that we should use this. We did pre-tests. We did manipulation checks, objective ones um, and subjective ones. So, we knew we had a strong manipulation. 
And um, lo and behold, when we compared the baseline to the pilot, firstly, we did much better than 200, so this speech was really not bad at all. In fact, we increased performance. The peace rate increased by precisely the amount, um, well, roundabout, I mean, he, he said approximately 20%, the amount that the economic model will predict, but we got the same increase from charisma. There was no difference between the workers' performance in the charismatic speech and in the non-charismatic speech. Now, these people were paid more money uh, and these people got the same output with less money, therefore, we could reduce the cost. I just want to show you the distribution of the workers' performance under the fixed wage condition. You see what the peace rate does, it pushes the workers much more to the right. And you see charismatic leadership pushes many of the people way, way, way to, to the right. Some don't react so well, uh, we, we don't know why, but on average, it's what we care. So we're still um, are trying to figure out um, why some people react well and where others do not react well, but overall they react very well and we get the same performance as economic incentives. And as I said before, um, the cost neutral uh, bonuses did not significantly increase the unit costs. It was 3.9%, not very much, but we reduced the cost per unit by about 19% uh, uh, with Charisma. We got the same output as economic performance incentives, but we didn't pay the same amount. So this is very nice, cool. Economists are not impressed with this because, well, although it is very impressive, um, well, let's do a tougher test. Let's see um, how we can jack this up in even tougher conditions and see if charisma matters. So we're going to do a stronger test in a more controlled environment where there's absolutely um, nothing else that could explain what's going on. So instead of studying effort, we're going to look at something more difficult to move that's player beliefs in a coordination game. Now, this is a really strong test. I'm going to show you what we did now. It's a public, it's a public goods game. So, of course, leadership can affect your preferences, whether you... You like the leader, you identify with the leader, and whether you will do what the leader asks you to do. But what also matters is, if we have a coordination game, you will only move to the extent that you believe that others will move too, as a function of the signal they've heard. If you don't believe they're going to move, you're not going to move either. So, so we believe that charisma works through preferences, but also beliefs. So how do we test this? We go to a public goods setting. We have four players that contribute to an endowment. They can keep their money every round, or they can put it in the public pot, and we will multiply it by some multiplication factor. We're going to randomize the subjects to one of three groups. They're going to get a charismatic video with cooperation, about cooperation, a non-charismatic vi uh, video about the benefits of cooperation, or no video. So typically, the public goods games uh, are played with no video, so we're using this as baseline condition to see what happens uh, when players have to try to solve a coordination problem. So we give them um, some points uh, over every round. They have to make a decision. These points are converted to Swiss francs by this conversion factor. Um, what money they make depends on how much money they keep in their personal account and what money everyone else puts in the public account. That's multiplied by 0.4. So players observe the decisions of group members after every round. And this is important because, uh, <laughs> you know, if they see that they're not contributing, uh, they very quickly start to not contribute themselves and the public good breaks down, just like in real world. In the real world, you have the free rider problem. It's very demotivating. We measure their beliefs after every round, and we observe actual contribution. It turns out that the beliefs very strongly uh, correlate with what contributions actually occurred. So the players can anticipate very well what's going to happen in the next round as a function of what every player has done in the current round. Um, we have 109 groups. Um, of four players, therefore 4,000 observations, we will cluster the standard errors at the group level because obviously observations nested within groups are not independent. So the speeches are delivered by the same actor in a standardized condition, they have the same number of words, they trigger the same demand effects in the two um, speech conditions. Eh? We don't have the same demand effect in the control condition, so therefore these two conditions collectively show what happens when you give people leadership in a coordination game. They're seen individually by each player on computer in a booth. It's a tough test. We're not looking at whether charisma affects performance, but beliefs. And the fact that some people may always defect will make them perhaps more likely to defect if they know that others are going to contribute. So that gives them the license to defect. Um, I don't have time to show you the speeches, but they're really great. Uh, we've got two versions of these because we did two experiments. If you go to my webpage, you can download everything. The speeches are in French, but they're subtitled in English for this experiment. Um, so here's the link. If you want to take a little uh, um, photo of this, uh, it's going to be at the end of my presentation 
um, as well. So we have this young actor. He behaves either charismatically or non-charismatically. Um, and uh, he just drops out of the sky. He has no stake in the game. They don't know who he is, but he just explains the benefit of cooperation and how they all will be much better off um, if they cooperate than if they don't. Um, so, for example, um, we use the tragedy of the commons, which we explain in a very technocratic economic way. I'll just let you look at it for a moment. So it's just saying very factually that um, if you cooperate, you'll be better off. If you don't, you'll all collectively be worse off. And then we explain the tragedy of the commons, not with words in kind of technocratic economic speak, but in more metaphorical speak. Like there's a common grazing ground and every farmer has a private incentive to graze his or her cows as much as possible. But if every farmer does that, the grazing green field is going to turn into mud. So it makes it very salient um, that it's really a good idea to cooperate and it triggers an image. It's easy to understand, it's easy to recall, and it's easy to see the parallel between what the leader has said and what they should do in the game. We ask some experts to predict what would happen in every round on average. So these experts were leadership researchers, uh, doctoral students, and EMBAs. Um, and here are the predictions. So out of 20 points, that's what the first group said. What's the second group said? About pretty similar. The uh, EMBAs were much more cynical, <laughs> as you may imagine. Um, and this is what actually happened. So we actually did increase um, contributions in the no charisma condition versus the control by about 30%, but by, we also did an additional 10% in the charismatic treatment, but at this time only charisma differs significantly from here. Here are the contributions over time per round. So you see what happens in the control condition is the public good breaks down very rapidly um, and approaches zero by the end of the game. But the cool thing is, so this experiment failed, and that's great, and we're going to publish this all together. Uh, these results are important because we know in this case that charisma does not differ from um, a normal uh, leadership, but we do observe a leadership effect. So collectively, those two treatments are much stronger in uh, triggering um, uh, the outcome that's desired than in the non-charismatic, in the non-leadership condition. So what we do now is we thought maybe there's a moral component that we should add to this. Perhaps money that's put in the public account. Uh, we should also match and uh, donate money to the Lausanne Children's Charity. Um, because in the first experiment, we had this moral component. So we introduced the moral component. We have uh, groups again. I mean, we're paying these students quite a bit of money, um, and we have quite a lot of, uh, we have 300 students now in this round. Our average student is earning 20, 25 Swiss francs. That's about 18, 19 pounds per session. So, you know, this is adding up the <laughs> every one of these experiments. We have to carefully think through because uh, it's costing a lot of money. We were lucky to have money from the Swiss National Science Foundation to do this. It pushes up contributions very significantly, but again, we don't find a difference between the two treatment conditions. We don't run the control condition anymore because we're not interested in that. Um, why is this? Perhaps the participants need to see the actor live. Perhaps they don't believe others saw the same video. It's unlikely because we never use deception in our labs. Um, that's one of the principles in, um, well, certain branches of psychology they don't use deception and in economics absolutely it's forbidden. Uh, perhaps they don't feel like they have a common identity, they're not in the same boat um, and, and, and here there's a wonderful quote by Maggie Thatcher, she once mentioned our country is weathering stormy waters, we may have different ideas on how best to navigate but we sail in the same ocean and in the same ship. So we did a simple tweak in the third experiment is that at the beginning of the session they watched the video together. So they couldn't speak to each other, but the students are going to be randomized to teams. So they're 20, 24, 30 students in, in the lab. They're going to watch the video together. Then they go to the booths, and then they're randomized to teams. So they know who's on their team. But for, for a fact now, they know that everyone has seen the video. They can see um, the reactions of everyone and how things um, turn out while they're watching the videos. So we have 223 um, students randomized into one of two conditions. And then we find the effect. Okay, so we have two failed lab studies, which were very informative and which we will publish in the package of papers. Um, but here you see that the charismatic condition almost defies the law of economic gravity. The contributions are sustained and very high. Many groups continue, contribute only 20 points, uh, the maximum amount every round. So when we correct for the ceiling effect using what's called the Tobit 
uh, regression, the effect is even stronger than what you observe here. So this is just the observe OLS um, effect. Um, as you can see, we reduce the number of defections. So uh, these are the, the total decisions at the individual level, people who never gave any any money at all to the public account, you see that we reduced it by a hefty amount and we also pushed maximum contributions by also a hefty amount. So you can see that the, the distribution is, is skewed to the right in the charismatic treatment. So here's a summary of the lab studies. So as you can see, this is the, we did get a small effect, uh, about 10% relative to the leadership condition in the first study. By putting a moral component, you see both of these jump by making the people watch the speeches together, it has no effect on the non-charismatic condition. So you see, this, the, there's no effect here, but we get the effect only in the charismatic condition. Um, so this is very interesting. We're doing more studies now to figure out how this mechanism is happening. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a couple more uh, slides on arch archival studies that we've done, and then I'll have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, so we took a random sample of 240 TED Talks, those are the ones that we used um, to train Deep Charisma on. And um, then we, we, we photographed the presenters. We ran a study in the lab to see how attractive they are. Attractiveness plays a huge effect. If someone's gonna go see a TED Talk, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, you would think, well, what, I mean, are they there just to look at someone who looks beautiful or are they there to listen to something interesting? It turns out that attractiveness plays a huge role. Um, so we control for how attractive they are, we control for the boner effect because we actually did randomly pull out boner's talk, very famous. So some people go and watch the TED talk, not because the TED talk's interesting, but because boner is giving it. So we go six months before, we look at the Wikipedia page of the person to see how famous they are. Um, so we control for the length of the Wikipedia page, we control for where the TED talk was given, we control for the population in which the, 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 the TED talk was uh, given, the country. We control for a zillion, million, billion things, type of TED talk, whatever, everything is in there. If anyone has any ideas about what control variables we, we should put in, we've presented this paper many times and whatever control we put in, uh, it seems that we've uh, done our econometric procedure correctly. And as you can see that putting 10, 10 more charismatic tactics increases views by about 23%. So the average TED talk has about 1.2 million views with about 30 of these tactics. You jack up the tactics, you see how it jacks up uh, the views that you get. So we have a very, very strong effect. We went to the most, um, the most stripped down communication means possible, TED, uh, Twitter. So there you can't even say very much. It was at the time when Twitter was limited to 140 characters and we studied 30 CEOs and 30 politicians over about three months and coded about 3,000 tweets. And then we looked at the proportion of charismatic tactics in the package of tweets that each person gave in. It turns out it didn't matter if they were CEO or a politician. We control for the number of followers they have the previous day because that necessarily um, will uh, affect how many retweets they get. And again, we see a very, very strong effect. The higher the proportion of charismatic tweeting the person does, in other words, the more charismatic the tweet uh, effect is at the leader level, the more retweets they, they get. So over here, we control for the fixed effects of the individual. So it may be uh, that some people are different and they get more retweets for a particular reason. We control for that because we have data over time. So we take out the mean intercept differences uh, by using what's called fixed effects estimation. And then we use the proportion of charismatic um, tweeting that's done to predict um, how many retweets they get. So that raises many questions. Um, do some of these tactics work better than others? I won't know that until I have big data, and I won't have big data until I can get deep charisma to work um, as well as a human. Then we can trawl over different speeches, web pages, whatever, and companies, politicians, and then figure out uniquely, you know, is it the metaphors that works better? Uh, it seems that some of these things may work better than others. Um, does it operate and persist in every situation? Where does it not work well? Where does it work well? Do they interact with incentives? These charismatic tactics, we do not know yet. Um, how does it uh, compare when we look at uh, charisma in the lab through video means and mediated by, by media? Uh, versus seeing someone live. Is there a moral component that always matters or does it not? So these are things that we're doing now in, uh, in, in, a, in a big, uh, large-scale studies, uh, different studies that uh, we, we're very fortunate to have money from the um, National Science Foundation of Switzerland to, to answer a lot of these uh, questions. So that's it from me. And I'll leave this up while I take questions. Thank you. <laughs>